This is part 9 of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please listen with an open mind. The Delphus Case On the evening of November 2, 1971, on the Johnson Farm located near Delphus, Kansas, an unknown object was reported to have come down almost to ground level and to have then taken off. It was seen by a young man and later by his parents, and it would simply have gone into the annals of ufology as one of many thousands of landings if it had not been for several secondary effects the objects created, it affected animals, it left peculiar traces on the ground, and, as in the French case of Averon, it affected the witness's sleeping pattern. Here again the young son of the farmer is the main witness. Sixteen-year-old Ronald Johnson was tending the sheep, accompanied by his dog, when the sighting happened. What he suddenly saw was a mushroom-shaped object, illuminated by multicolored lights over its entire surface and hovering 25 yards away, within two feet of the ground. Its diameter was about nine feet. The glow from the object was such that Ronald could see no details, and it was making a sound like an old washing machine which vibrates. Then it brightened at the base and took off. The witness reportedly became temporarily blind. During all this the dog was very quiet. After several minutes, Ronald, regaining his sight, ran into the house to call his parents, and all came out again to see the object, now high in the sky and over half the full moon in size. It vanished into the distance. The three witnesses went around the house to the site of the near landing and were surprised, they said, to observe a glowing ring on the ground. Parts of nearby trees were also glowing. The texture of the soil, reports an experienced investigator, Mr. Ted Phillips, felt strange, like a slick crust, as if the soil was crystallized. And Mrs. Johnson noticed that her fingers went numb, as if a local anesthetic had been applied. She is a nurse at a nearby hospital, and for two weeks this condition prevented her from taking the pulse of her patients. The next day the ring was still clearly visible, with a dry and crusty appearance. The inside and the outside of the ring were damp from recent rains, but the ring itself was perfectly dry. Thirty-two days later, when Ted Phillips was able to go to the scene, snow had fallen and was melting both outside and inside the ring, but the one-foot-wide ring was perfectly white. We removed snow from one section of the ring and introduced water into the exposed ring area, the soil would not permit the water to pass through the surface. This was most remarkable, as there had been several inches of rain and snow. Phillips removed a sample from the ring and observed that it contained a high concentration of a whitish material. The soil under the ring was dry to a depth of at least one foot. This is not an isolated occurrence. Hundreds of reports of ring-shaped patterns have been gathered, and many of them refer to a white substance or powder at the site. A similar occurrence took place in New Zealand, at a place named Waihoke, in January 1965. The ring there was visible for four years before it was finally covered with grass. It is curious that in spite of all the excitement caused by the Delphus case and the attention it received from scientific ufologists and from skeptics, no one, believer or skeptic, ever bothered to identify the white substance itself. Thorough analyses of the soil have been made, however, showing no significant difference between the inside and the outside of the ring. I eventually obtained a sample of the white substance from Mr. Phillips and forwarded it to a biological laboratory in France, where it was examined under a microscope with magnifications ranging from a few diameters to the maximum enlargement possible under the oil immersion technique. The white substance was resolved into fibers, thus destroying the explanation of the case put forth by Philip Glass in his book UFOs Explained, where he claimed the substance was produced by the urine of sheep feeding from a circular device. The fibers were vegetal in nature and belonged to an organism of the order of the Actinomycetes, which is an intermediate organism between bacteria and fungus. The French biologist who identified it, and who has wished not to be named in this book, determined that the organism belongs to the family of the Actinomycete and the genus Nocardia. It is often found together with a fungus of the order of the Basidiomycetes, which may fluoresce under certain conditions. This fungus can cause a circular pattern to be visible on the surface of the ground. This is undoubtedly the explanation for some UFO rings, but the coincidence of this fungus ring with the observation made by the Johnsons remains to be explained. 
One possible interpretation is that high energy stimulation triggered the spectacular growth of the nocardia and of an exiting fungus and caused the latter to fluoresce. The effects of the glowing object in animals were consistent with other landing cases. During the sighting itself, the dog was very quiet and still. The sheep were bellowing, but like the dog they were almost glued to the spot. The boy could not move either, but it was not clear to him whether this was due to fear or to another cause. The behavior of the animals after the sighting was remarkable. For about two weeks, every evening at sunset, the sheep would jump out of the pen and run wildly. The dog would furiously try to get into the house at nightfall. He practically destroyed the screen door, and the only way to keep him outside was to replace it with a stronger metal door. There were striking effects on the witness himself, too. First he suffered from strong eye irritation, his eyes were red and watery. Then came the headaches and the nightmares. These nightmares, lasting about one week, were so vivid that he would wake up his parents with loud screams. He had the same dream, night after night, in which human-like creatures were looking into his window from the outside. Two or three times, when coming into his bedroom, his parents found him screaming, standing by the window. The Confusion Technique in the Contact Ritual Earlier I recounted the story of a witness who was asked the time by a UFO occupant. It is 2.30, the witness replied. You lie, it is 4 o'clock, said the occupant. I am indebted to Gerald Oskavold for bringing to my attention a fascinating story by Dr. Milton Erickson, a pioneer in modern hypnosis, concerning the gentle art of reframing, one windy day. A man came rushing around the corner of a building and bumped hard against me as I stood bracing myself against the wind. Before he could recover his poise to speak to me, I glanced elaborately at my watch and courteously, as if he had inquired the time of day, I stated, it's exactly 10 minutes of 2, though it was actually closer to 4 p.m., and walked on. About half a block away, I turned and saw him still looking at me, undoubtedly still puzzled and bewildered by my remark. After quoting this story, psychologist Paul Watzlawick comments in his book Change, this is how Erickson described the incident that led him to the development of an unusual method of hypnotic induction which he later called the confusion technique. What had taken place? The incident of bumping into each other had created a context in which the obvious conventional response would have been mutual apologies. Dr. Erickson's response suddenly and unexpectedly redefined that same context as a very different one, namely, one that would have been socially appropriate if the other man had asked him the time of day, but even that would have been bewildering because of the patent incorrectness of the information, in contrast to the courteous, solicitous manner in which it was given. The result was confusion, unalleviated by any further information that would have reorganized the pieces of the puzzle into an understandable new frame of reference. As Erickson points out, the need to get out of the confusion by finding this new frame makes the subject particularly ready and eager to hold on firmly to the next piece of concrete information that he is given. The confusion, setting the stage for reframing, thus becomes an important step in the process of effecting second-order change and of showing the fly the way out of the fly bottle. Was the alleged UFO pilot trying to show the witness the way out of a similar maze? Is this confusion technique deliberately used to effect change on a major scale? Answering such questions could also help us to understand the strong resemblance that anyone who has examined the beliefs of esoteric groups could not fail to note between certain UFO encounters and the initiation rituals of secret societies. This opening of the mind to a new set of symbols that is reported by many witnesses is precisely what the various occult traditions also try to achieve. The case of Jose Antonio a case in point is the story of Jose Antonio, an enlisted Brazilian soldier in the military police of Minas Gerais and orderly to Major Celio Ferreira, who commanded at that time a guards battalion. An investigation conducted by Mr. Brent Alexo and published in the Flying Saucer Review, November-December 1973, disclosed that one Sunday afternoon in May 1969, Jose Antonio was fishing on a lagoon north of Belo Horizonte when he suddenly became aware of figures moving behind him. He saw a burst of light hit his legs and felt a numbness that caused him to drop his fishing rod and fall to his knees. He was seized by two masked individuals about four feet tall, wearing dull aluminum suits, who took him to a machine that looked like an upright cylinder. 
Inside this craft the beings gave him a helmet similar to their own, tied him up, and took off. The higher the machine seemed to rise, the more difficult did breathing seem for the soldier, and at one stage, in addition to his state of low morale, he felt as though his whole body was physically tired out, almost paralyzed. He felt more and more uncomfortable in this position, owing to the hardness and the shape of the seat, the numbness in his legs, and the weight of the helmet, the corners of which were bruising his shoulders and neck. After a period of travel that seemed interminable, the machine landed with a jarring sensation, and the little men unfastened Jose Antonio. They put a bandage over the eye holes in his helmet and carried him with his knees dragging on the ground. He heard footsteps and the sound of many people talking. Finally he was placed on a backless seat and the bandage was removed. Jose Antonio found himself in a large quadrangular room, 30 by 40 feet, about 15 feet away from a robust dwarf who stared at him with apparent satisfaction. The dwarf was extremely hairy, his long tresses, reddish and wavy, fell down behind past his shoulders to his waist, his beard was long and thick and came down to his stomach. He had wide set eyebrows, two fingers thick, running right across the whole forehead. His skin was light colored, very pale. His eyes were round, larger than is the norm with us, and of a green shade like the color of green leaves beginning to wither. Other beings of similar appearance began arriving until about fifteen dwarfs were in the room. The soldier assumed there was a door in the back beyond his field of vision. The three walls he could see had no window and no door. To his left was a low shelf with the corpses of four men, one of them a negro. He thought they had been killed by the homunculi. The whole room seemed to be made of stone, and at one point Jose Antonio was given something to drink out of a cubicle stone glass, and the cavity containing a dark green liquid was in the shape of an inverted pyramid. The lighting in the room was uniform and intensely bright and from no identifiable source. On the left wall were paintings of animals, a jaguar, a monkey, a giraffe, an elephant, also vehicles, houses. In the far right angle of the room was something that looked like an upside-down racing car. He watched while the homunculi examined all his fishing equipment and carefully took one of every item in duplicate. They kept one specimen of each type of fishing hook and a single banknote from a total of 35,000 old cruzeros. The leader of the dwarfs began a strange conversation with the soldier. It was conducted entirely through gestures and drawings and revolved around the concept of weapons. Jose Antonio thinks that they must have perceived that he was in the military and illustrated this by their actions. At one time, a little man shot a beam of light against the stone wall. The communication seemed to be a request that Jose Antonio help the little beings in their relations with Earth. Was he to be their guide among men? This is what Jose Antonio understood. He gestured his refusal and began praying, fingering the rosary he always carried with him. The leader stepped towards him and, displaying irritation for the first time, seized the crucifix and snatched it from him. One of the beads rolled onto the floor and was picked up by one of the little men, who showed it to the others. The crucifix was passed around in the same way, arousing the curiosity of all of them. While this discussion took place among the homunculi Jose Antonio had a vision of a Christ-like entity, his eyes clear and serene, barefoot and wearing a dark robe. The figure made some revelations to Jose Antonio, who now refuses to disclose them. The apparition vanished. The irritated dwarfs blindfolded him again, and he was transported back. As the machine landed, he felt that he was being dragged and he lost consciousness. He woke up alone near the town of Vitoria in the state of Espirito Santo, 200 miles away from the spot where he had been fishing. He had been away for four and a half days. There is a curious parallel to this case in the experiences of Robert Monroe whose investigations of out-of-body travel have already been mentioned. On a particular occasion he had the feeling of being outside his body, fighting with two small beings, desperate for a solution, I thought about fire and this seemed to help a little. However, I got the impression that they were both amused, as if there was nothing I could do to harm them. By this time I was sobbing for help. Then I saw someone else coming up out of the corner of my eye. I first thought it was another one, but this was very definitely a man. 
He simply stopped a short distance away and watched what was taking place with a very serious expression on his face. He wore a dark robe down to his ankles. I could not see his feet. As in the case of Jose Antonio, the apparition of the taller man was the signal for the end of the ordeal. Initiation rituals are characterized by the following phases or general scenes, often combined or developed into complex themes. The candidate is confronted by members of the occult group wearing a special costume. He is blindfolded. He is led by the arm through a rough and difficult route. He is taken into a specially designed chamber with no windows and is placed in such a way that he can only see part of it. He is brought in the presence of a master. He is given a test and made to answer questions. He is shown a variety of symbols designed to remind him of death. The situation suggests that he may not survive the ordeal. He is given ritual food or drink. He is blindfolded again and led outside. All of these elements are present in the case of Jose Antonio. To this we must add that everything in the room appeared to be made out of stone. The drinking cube with the inverted pyramid cavity is an exquisite last touch. The case of Paolo Gaetano. Another remarkable case from South America will close this chapter, raising further possibilities for the nature of confrontation. On November 17, 1971, at 9.30 p.m., a Brazilian man named Paulo Gaetano was driving back from the town of Natividad de Carangola on a business trip. With him in the car was another man, Mr. LVOB. As they passed the town of Bananeras, Paulo felt the car was not pulling normally, and he mentioned this to his companion, who reacted by saying only that he was tired and wanted to sleep. The engine stalled and Paulo had to stop the car on the side of the road. He then saw an object about 12 feet away. A red beam of light was projected at the car and seemed to cause the door to open. Several small beings appeared, took Paolo into the craft, and made him lie down on a small table. Fastening his arms, they lowered from the ceiling an apparatus that resembled an x-ray machine. He felt a cut near his elbow, and the beings collected his blood. Investigators from the Spoved Research Group in Brazil saw and photographed the wound three days later, then he was shown two panels one of them a plan of the town of Itapiruna, the other a picture of an atomic explosion. Paolo felt heavy. He remembers being helped by LVO, but does not recall how they got back home. The interesting point is that the witness was not alone. Did LVO also see the flying saucer? No. He only saw a bus, near Benineras, Paolo had begun to show signs of nervousness, LVO reported. He told him that there was a flying saucer accompanying them, when in fact what was following them was a bus which was keeping at a reasonable distance behind the car. Elvio added that the car had slowed down and stopped, and that he had come to the assistance of Paolo after he had fallen to the ground, behind the car, with the door on the driver's side remaining open. Elvio managed to get Paolo on his feet and started with him by bus toward Itapiruna, where Paolo was examined by the first aid station. The police sent a patrol to the site and found Paolo's car on the highway. Elvio was unable to explain what had happened to Paolo and why the door was open. He did not remember when Paolo had gotten out, and he could not explain why they had taken the bus. The police found no trace on the car that could explain the wound on Paolo's arm. Some experiments with microwaves suggest that it is becoming technically feasible for sensory impressions to be projected into people's minds at a distance. Is this part of the technology that is involved in the UFO phenomenon? Here again we must ask, are we dealing with a technology that systematically confuses the witnesses? If so, it must be possible to duplicate it. If certain areas of the human brain can be remotely stimulated, then it is not impossible to think of broadcasts literally saturating large territories with a flood of symbols. Such a technology could be an important factor in the confrontation with advanced psychotronic devices. 7. The Spiritual Component, A Morphology of Miracles What happened at Fatima? Many descriptions of UFO phenomena force us to deal simultaneously with two categories we always attempt to separate, the physical, or technical, and the spiritual, or divine. Numerous witnesses, in their statements after a close encounter, claim bluntly that the experience of the phenomenon has a religious meaning to them. Perhaps it does. 
Perhaps we need not only a scientific breakthrough here but a consciousness breakthrough as well, a global, historical grasp of the beliefs, materialistic as well as idealistic, among which we have been groping for 10,000 years. Steven Spielberg capitalized on this idea at the end of the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So did Whitley Strieber in his book Communion. But it has been captured in the most complete and most artistic form in John Fowle's extraordinary masterpiece, A Maggot, published in 1986. The famous apparitions at Fatima offer a historical example of the religious dimension of UFO encounters. The case is a celebrated one, yet I am prepared to wager that few Americans know the full story of what happened in 1917 near that small Portuguese town. I suspect that even fewer realize that the entire sequence of observations of an entity thought to be the Virgin Mary had begun two years previously with a fairly classical sequence of UFO sightings. If we accept the interpretation given of Fatima by the Catholic Church, we are dealing with a phenomenon that cannot be explained either as a physical effect or as an illusion. In its decision of 1930, arrived at after 13 years of painstaking investigations by many scholars, the Church states that, the solar phenomenon of the 13th of October 1917, described in the press of the time, was most marvelous and caused the greatest impression on those who had the happiness of witnessing it. This phenomenon, which no astronomical observatory registered and which therefore was not natural, was witnessed by persons of all categories and of all social classes, believers and unbelievers, journalists of the principal Portuguese newspapers and even by persons some miles away, facts which annul any explanation of collective illusion. This miracle, the reader will note, had been predicted several months before by three illiterate children after their vision of a woman in a bright glow. She had not said that she was the Virgin Mary. She had simply stated that she was from heaven and instructed them to return every month until October, when a public miracle would take place so that everyone may believe. The events at Fatima involve luminous spheres, lights with strange colors, a feeling of heat waves, all physical characteristics commonly associated with UFOs. They even include the typical falling leaf motion of the saucer zigzagging through the air. They also encompass prophecy and a loss of ordinary consciousness on the part of witnesses, what we have called the psychic component of UFO sightings. The Pattern of Prophecy The first apparition at Fatima of the woman took place on May 13, 1917. Three children were watching their sheep when a bright flash surprised them, and they walked toward the large hollow pasture called Cova de Iria, literally, the Cave of Saint Irene, an old sacred spot, to see what had happened. They found themselves caught in a glowing light that almost blinded them, and in the center of the light they perceived a little woman, who spoke to them, begging them to return every month to the same spot. While the children had been alone on the first occasion, there were fifty people the second time, on June 13th. They watched while the little shepherds knelt and became transfigured, as if transported into another world, at the time of the observation. The oldest child, Lucia, who was ten at the time, addressed an unseen entity whose answers were not heard by others in the group. One spectator, however, reported perceiving a very faint voice or the buzzing of a bee, a typical sound associated with modern-day UFOs. At the end of the dialogue all witnesses heard an explosion and saw a small cloud rise from the vicinity of a tree, on which all the succeeding manifestations would center. The following month, on July 13th, the number of witnesses rose to 4,500. This third apparition was especially remarkable in several respects. It included detailed descriptions by some of the spectators of physical phenomena that are specific enough to be compared to UFO data. In the words of Joseph Peltier, in the sun danced at Fatima, a buzzing or humming sound, a decrease in the sun's glow and heat, a small whitish cloud about the three of the apparitions, and a loud noise at the lady's departure. It is also remarkable that the children were shown a vision of hell that terrified them and were given a specific prophecy announcing more apparitions of unknown lights in the sky. The war is going to end, but if people do not stop offending God another and worse one will begin during the reign of Pius XI. Note, he died in 1939. When you see a night illuminated by an unknown light know that this is the great sign that God is giving you that he is going to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine and persecution of the Church and of the Holy Father. 
To prevent this I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia. If they heed my request, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world. The mixture of seriousness and absurdity that we have already noted in several contactee stories is an unmistakable characteristic of this statement. We will find the same thing to be true in Lourdes, where the alleged Virgin Mary instructs the little Bernadette to perform meaningless actions. The pattern of prophecy followed its course. On August 13, 18,000 people were at the site of the apparitions. The children, however, were not present. They had been kidnapped and jailed by a local official who had decided to put an end to this nonsense. In their absence, a clap of thunder was heard, followed by a bright flash. A small whitish cloud was forming around the tree. It hovered for a few minutes, then rose and melted away. The clouds in the sky had turned crimson red, and then changed to pink, yellow, and blue. Colored light like a rainbow on the ground, Clouds around the sun reflecting different colors on the people, such are some of the terms the witnesses used to describe it. The witnesses saw falling flowers, the famous phenomenon of angel hair so consistently reported after the passage of a UFO, and sometimes interpreted as an ionization effect. One man, Manuel Pedro Mardo, in a statement made under oath during the canonical inquiry, reported seeing clearly a luminous globe spinning through the clouds. On August 19 the children had been released and were tending sheep near Algestrel when, about 4 p.m., they noticed a sudden lowering of the temperature. The sun, they said, became yellowish, the colors of the rainbow once again filled the countryside, visible to adults in the vicinity, as was later established. The bright flash was seen, and a glowing light came to settle about a tree near the children. The entity, clothed in white and gold, stood once more in the center of the glow. The witnesses fell on their knees and feasted their souls in rapture. A dialogue followed in which the apparition asked the children to make sacrifices for sinners. After ten minutes the Lady of Light departed slowly toward the east with a roaring sound. Apparitions of a Flying Globe On September 13 the crowd numbered 30,000, including two priests who were absolutely skeptical and had come specifically to establish the falsity of the much-heralded miracles. The site of the apparitions was a wide amphitheater where most of the crowd had gathered to be close to the tree of the apparitions. However, the two skeptical priests had chosen a spot on the higher ground from which they could observe everything. The following is based on their report. Noon. The sun got dimmer, although no clouds were seen in the sky. Thousands cried, there she is. Look! A globe of light was seen by all, advancing slowly down the valley, from east to west, toward the children. It came to rest on the tree. A white cloud formed and, out of the empty sky, shiny white petals began to fall. Let us ponder this description of the phenomenon by a witness, as the people stare at this strange sight they soon notice that the falling, blistering globules, contrary to the laws of perspective, grow smaller and smaller as they near them. And when they reach out their hands and hats to catch them they find that they have somehow melted away. The children saw the entity again in the center of the globe, and the dialogue began once more between the lady and Lucia. The promise of a miracle on October 13 was repeated. Then the radiant globe rose and disappeared into the sun. Asked what he thought the globe was, one of the priests, now quite shaken, stated that it was a heavenly vehicle that carried the Mother of God from her throne above to this forbidden wasteland. The concept of the earth as a prison or forbidden wasteland is a popular one among those who have been exposed to these phenomena. The last apparition, as predicted, took place on October 13, 1917. The crowd numbered 70,000 this time. The size of the assembled crowd had grown in the following progression, 3, 50, 4,500, 18,000, 30,000, 70,000, the vision was preceded by a flash of light at noon and a sweet strange fragrance. The children engaged in a dialogue with the lady. Witnesses did observe the dramatic change on the faces of the three children, enraptured by the vision. The predicted miracle took place as the apparition left the Cova de area. The rain that had been pouring down on the crowd suddenly stopped, and the heavy clouds parted. The sun appeared as a disk of brilliant silver, a weird disk that turns rapidly on its own axis and casts off beams of colored lights in all directions. 
Shafts of red light shot out from the rim of the sun and colored the clouds, the earth, the trees, the people, then shafts of violet, of blue, of yellow and of other colors followed in succession. These colors have been described by an objective skeptic as monochromatic sectors, and they were definitely revolving. The reports speak of a flat disk rather than a globe. After a while it stopped spinning and plunged downward in zigzag fashion toward the earth and the horrified spectators. Most witnesses believe their last hour had come. Many of them, including the debunkers, knelt in the mud and began publicly confessing their sins. Finally the disc reversed its motion and disappeared into the sun, the real sun, once again fixed and dazzling in the sky. The astounded crowd suddenly realized that their clothes were dry. Such is the story of Fatima as it can be reconstructed from reports of the time and from church investigations. The final miracle had come at the culmination of a precise series of apparitions combined with contacts and messages that place it very clearly, in my opinion, in the perspective of UFO phenomena. Not only was a flying disc or globe consistently involved, but its motion, its falling leaf trajectory, its light effects, the thunderclaps, the buzzing sounds, the strange fragrance, the fall of angel hair that dissolves upon reaching the ground, the heat wave associated with the close approach of the disc, all of these are frequent parameters of UFO sightings everywhere. And so are the paralysis, the amnesia, the conversations, and the healings. The Angel of Peace Few of the books on Fatima provide us with details of the children's background. Yet in all apparition phenomena, it is crucial to investigate this background thoroughly and to ask as precisely as possible for descriptions of the earliest incidents that set the witness on a path to extraordinary realities. In the case of Fatima the events did not begin, as most authorities indicate, on May 13, 1917. It is true that such is the date of the first apparition of the lady, but this had been preceded by a series of sightings of an angel a couple of years before. These sightings cast serious doubts on the interpretation of the miracle given by the Catholic Church. In April 1915, when Lucia was eight, she was reciting the rosary near Fatima when she saw a transparent white cloud and a human form. This happened a second time in the same year, and a third time in October. Then, during 1916, Lucia was visited three times by the angel. The first occasion was in the spring. Lucia was with two of her cousins when rain started to fall. The children sought shelter in a small cave. After lunch the rain had stopped, and they were playing at the entrance of the cave when they heard the rumble of a powerful wind, another constant in UFO behavior, and a white light appeared. It was gliding through the valley above the treetops. In the light was a youth of admirable beauty who came close to them and said, I am the angel of peace. He taught the children a prayer and disappeared. The three little ones were left in a trance, they kept repeating and repeating the prayer, mechanically, until they literally fell from exhaustion. The next incident took place on a hot day in midsummer 1916. This time, the angel appeared suddenly and asked, What are you doing? Pray. Pray a great deal. Offer prayers and sacrifices continually. How are we to offer sacrifices? Asked Lucia. Make a sacrifice of everything that you possibly can. Above all, accept and bear with submission the suffering that the Lord shall send you. The children were left paralyzed. It was only toward the evening that they regained their senses and began to play again. In this case, as in the previous one, the witnesses did not want to discuss the matter, not even among themselves. Peltier reports that, the experience has been so intimate and so manifestly sacred that none of them ever thinks of revealing it, or even the smallest part of it, to anyone else. It is obviously a favor to be kept for themselves. Of that they are absolutely and instinctively persuaded. The next day they still could not explain their reactions to the apparitions, I don't know what is happening to me, said one of the little girls. I cannot speak, nor play, not sing and I haven't the strength to do anything. The angel appeared one more time, in the fall of 1916, in the cave at Cabeso. He gave the children communion. Analyzing the power that prompted the young witnesses to imitate the actions of this angels and to repeat his prayer slavishly, Peltier offers this perceptive remark, this power is so intense that it absorbs and almost completely annihilates them. 
it practically deprives them of the use of their bodily senses. Their bodies are subject to a mysterious, depressing force that prostrates them. His remark could apply to the entire spectrum of close encounters with UFOs. The Impact of Fatima What were the sequels to the Fatima story? The lives of many people who attended the miracles were deeply changed. Some were cured of a variety of diseases. At my mother's request, I went once more to Cova de Iria in August at the time of the apparitions, writes engineer Mario Goginio. Once more I came back discouraged and disappointed. But that time, something extraordinary happened. My mother, who had had a large tumor in one of her eyes for many years, was cured. The doctors who had attended her said they could not explain such a cure. This is just one among hundreds of such testimonies. At the time of the final miracle, many people were driven out of their senses, even those who saw it from a distance of several miles and were not in the company of other witnesses who might have influenced them. A child of twelve, named Albano Barros, for example, who was in a field near Mind, eight miles from Fatima, was so struck when he saw the disk of light falling toward the earth that he does not remember what followed, I cannot even remember whether I took the sheep home, whether I ran, or what I did. Others were so afflicted that, like Farmer Manuel Francisco, they went home weeping. Another witness, a lady who now lives in the United States, near Albany, added this comment, even today, whenever there is lightning, I remember it, and I am afraid. A prominent lawyer, Mr. Mendez, stated in an interview with John Hafford in 1960, what I saw at Fatima could not help but affect the interior life and I am sure that all who saw the miracle, or even heard about it, cannot fail to be impressed by its greatness. I still remember it today as vividly as at the moment it happened, and I feel myself to be dominated by that extraordinary event. Another witness reports, I always keep thinking about the sign. An extremely interesting series of testimonies came from witnesses who were not at Cova de Iria, but miles away from the crowd. I have already mentioned the observation made by Albano Barros in mind. A woman named Mrs. Gilhermina Lopes da Silva, who lived in Lyria no less than 16 miles from the site of the miracle, could not go to the place appointed for the apparition, but she looked toward the mountain at noon and saw a great red flash in the sky. The brilliance was such that it was seen 30 miles away, at San Pedro de Mule, by Portuguese writer Afonso Vieira, his wife, and his mother-in-law. The phenomenon, it seems, could not be photographed directly with the emulsions and shutter speeds commonly aviable at the time. One picture often produced by the newspapers and alleged to show the miracle is in fact a photograph of an eclipse of the sun that has nothing to do with it. There are many pictures of the crowd during the miracle however, and the actual brightness of the disk is an unresolved question. Two witnesses looked at it with binoculars and reported seeing a ladder and two beings. The edges of the disk, according to all descriptions, were sharp. And it was definitely not blinding, although pictures of the crowd show many witnesses shading their eyes. But others report that the phenomenon darkened the sun to such an extent that at one point they could see the moon and the stars. Another remote witness was a schoolboy who was so impressed by what he saw that he subsequently became a priest. An American Catholic writer named John Hafford interviewed him in 1960. At the time of the miracle the schoolboy was with his brother and other children in the village of Alburatel, nine miles away from the Cova de Iria, and here is what he experienced. I looked fixedly at the sun which seemed pale and did not hurt my eyes. Looking like a ball of snow, revolving on itself, it suddenly seemed to come down in a zigzag, menacing the earth. Terrified, I ran and hid myself among the people, who were weeping and expecting the end of the world at any moment. It was a crowd which had gathered outside our local village school and we had all left classes and run into the streets because of the cries and surprised shouts of men and women who were in the street in front of the school when the miracle began. There was an unbeliever there who had spent the morning mocking the simpletons who had gone off to Fatima just to see an ordinary girl. He now seemed paralyzed, his eyes fixed on the sun. He began to tremble from head to foot, and lifting up his arms, fell on his knees in the mud, crying out to God. But meanwhile the people continued to cry out and to weep, asking God to pardon their sins. We all ran to the two chapels in the village, which were soon filled to overflowing. 
During those long moments of the solar prodigy, objects around us turned all colors of the rainbow. When the people realized that the danger was over, there was an explosion of joy. Two of the three children at Fatima died young, as the lady had predicted, but Lucia lived secluded in a convent to an advanced age. The physics of the BVM we have just examined one series of apparently miraculous events, namely those related to the Fatima observations of the entity described by percipients as the Blessed Virgin Mary. These percipients, of course, have been exposed to such a powerful alteration of reality that their statements, from the observation on, are distorted by their emotions. This does not mean we should reject their testimony. It is consistent with many other reports. On February 11, 1858, a 14-year-old girl named Bernadette Subaru was gathering firewood by a narrow stream near Lourdes, in the south of France, when she heard a great noise, like the sound of a storm. She looked around her but neither the trees or the water was disturbed. Then she heard the sound again. In fear, she looked straight up and lost all power of speech and thought. From a nearby cave or grotto came a golden-colored cloud. Soon after came an entity, described as a beautiful lady, who placed herself above a bush that was moving as if it were windy. At Fatima, there was a wind which moved across the mountain without touching the trees. The lady of Fatima consistently appeared in the top branches of a small tree, whose center shoots were found bent toward the east, as though tilted in that direction when the apparition departed. Lucia, of Fatima, was closely questioned on this point and stated that Our Lady's feet rested lightly on the top of the leaves. Montes de Oca adds in his book more about Fatima that the topmost branches of the tree were bent in the form of a parasol and remained thus as if an invisible weight had come to rest upon them. When the Lady of Lourdes looked at Bernadette, all fear left the girl, but she seemed to no longer know where she was. She wanted to pray but as she tried to lift her hand to her forehead her arm remained paralyzed, and it is only after the lady had crossed herself that Bernadette could do the same. When the story became known it was met with incredulity by the local authorities and by the Prisettes. Father Paramali, who was the curé of the town, was especially angry and suggested that the lady should make the rose bush bloom before the whole crowd in order to convince everyone. When Bernadette conveyed to the lady this demand on the part of the local priest, the apparition simply smiled. For fifteen days she appeared to Bernadette, and their conversations centered on the lady's request for a chapel and for processions there. At times the dialogue was totally absurd, and it was absurd in the same sense as the conversations with UFO knots we have reviewed. On one occasion, the lady told Bernadette to go and wash herself in a non-existent spring, and in another she ordered her bluntly to go and eat the grass that grows over there. A study of these events from the point of view of the esoteric tradition might be rewarding. Occult masters like Gurdjieff and Crowley were wont to send their disciples on insane errands such as carrying stones to a mountaintop as a test of their devotion or as a discipline conducive to a spiritual awakening. The early story of Mary herself, and the miracles that surrounds her life, point to intriguing similarities with earlier deities, and in particular with the Egyptian goddess Isis. Like many targets of UFO manifestations, Mary was hit by a mysterious beam of light and subsequently bore a fatherless child. The scene at Fatima is reminiscent of the Phoenician amulets described earlier. However, we are not concerned here with an interpretation of mythology but with an attempt to deal with reports of observations that seem to form extraordinary patterns. One such pattern is that of the cloud and the cave, a common thread between Fatima, Lourdes, and other apparitions. In the Apocrypha we find the same pattern, they stood in the place of the cave, and behold a bright cloud overshadowing the cave. And the midwife said, My soul is magnified this day, because mine eyes have seen marvelous things, for salvation is born unto Israel. And immediately the cloud withdrew itself out of the cave, and great light appeared in the cave so that our eyes could not endure it. And by little and little that light withdrew itself until the young child appeared. A superficial examination of the phenomena of Lourdes would seem to indicate that a rather simple furl, Bernadette was illiterate and spent most of her day repeating prayers while accomplishing some menial chores for her very poor parents, simply turned into a visionary and soon shared her insanity with increasingly large crowds. But the story deserves closer examination. First, there is the matter of the spring. During the ninth apparition of the lady, Bernadette was instructed to go and wash and drink in the spring 
but there was no spring. Bernadette looked for a spring, found none, and in despair began to dig into the sand. Water appeared and filled the hole, turning the soil to mud. Bernadette tried to wash and only managed to smear her face with the mud. The crowd laughed at her, especially when she attempted to drink and later to eat the grass. Bernadette had dug the hole in a sort of stupor but seems to have done so at just the right time and place for a spring to appear. Indeed, the next day there was a clean little stream at the spot. A blind man named Louis Bouriette bathed his eyes in the spring and regained his sight. A dying baby was said to be restored to full health. The attitude of the crowd changed. The next phase of the apparitions was marked by a request for penance. Bernadette was instructed to kiss the ground for sinners. The girl, and all those in attendance, began kissing the ground as a gesture of humility. The gesture is indeed a moving one. It is even interpreted by some as a sweeping social panacea, as, for example, Stephen Breen says, they were setting an example of prayer and humility which could save Europe if applied to the social problems of the time, which, after all, are only a collection of personal problems, in the final analysis. Many of us will disagree with this rather simplistic and superficial view of social problems, but the point made here is the illustration of a mechanism through which phenomena such as UFO sightings and contacts with paranormal entities can play a role far beyond their local impact. For France at the end of the 19th century, as for Portugal in 1917, the apparitions of the mysterious lady were in many respects social and political turning points, deeply influencing the collective psyche. Another interesting observation concerns the nature of the state of trance experienced by Bernadette. One doctor had decided to expose her as a mental case and performed a fascinating experiment. This man, Dr. Duzas, witnessed a natal flame applied to Bernadette's hand for 15 minutes, measured by his watch. When she finished her prayers he could observe the glow of ecstasy leaving her face. I asked her to show me her left hand. I examined it most carefully but could not find the least trace of burning anywhere on it. I then asked the person who was holding the candle to light it again and give it to me. I put it several times in succession under Bernadette's left hand but she drew it away quickly, saying, you're burning me. I record this fact just as I have seen it without attempting to explain it. Shining Beings Evans Wentz, who knew equally well the traditions of Tibet and those of Scotland, was one of the greatest students of folklore in this century. After all his life travels he came to California and spent his last years near San Diego, where he befriended the local Indians and diligently studied their culture and traditions. He made some interesting discoveries in California and left many notes in manuscript form. They contain interesting ideas on the relationship between religion and paranormal phenomena. The most interesting theory put forth by Evans Wentz is a further development of the observation that ancient gods are continued under new names as myths evolve from civilization to civilization. Could it be, he asked, that every land has its own psychic and telluric forces, contributing to the appearance of certain spirit entities, regarded by human beings as gods and goddesses? Could the parallelism between Mormonism and ancient Indian beliefs be an example of such a process? Frank Waters had pointed out before Evans Wentz that the early white settlers in America had become very closely Indian in spirit and feeling. He writes in Mass Gods, they had confronted here that great psychic entity which was the spirit of place, the heart of a new continent. It shattered them completely. But each succumbed in a different way. The vision of God and Jesus experienced by Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Latter-day Saints, was in fact, Evans Wentz believes, a vision of the shining beings, known in other parts of the world as Davis. These shining beings appeared to Indians during secret rituals performed on high places or sacred mountains. Thus, the Winnebago's tell of a youth who climbed the mountain, eager to find wisdom. He fasted for twelve days, and a spirit came to him, giving him knowledge and teaching him wonderful words that brought health, welfare, and long life. He came back to his people with a song expressing this newly discovered wisdom, and the song began, Into solitude when I and wisdom was revealed to me. Sayeth the spirit, Dream, oh, dream again, and tell of me, dream thou. Such a vision quest is universal among the Indians of America, although among some tribes, such as the Pueblos and Navajos, 
it is limited to the priests and initiates. To Evans Wentz, the beings contacted in the course of such visions are identical with the Celtic creatures of the secret commonwealth, and he concludes that there is evidence for their true existence. These beings are the guardians of secret places, holding them in trust for a future of wonders. Evans Wentz had been told by the Irish poet William Butler Yeats that such places existed and were thus guarded. He identifies one such spot in France, one in County Wicklow, Ireland, one in Campania, Italy, and others in Asia and America. Can we then use the vast and untapped reservoir of fantastic events in the collections of UFO lore to force an answer from our gods old and new, to bring them down to a human dimension, or to understand their power? Or do we find ourselves locked in their maze, their fly bottle? Is the time of our inquiry always wrong, the place always elsewhere? Are the angels in heaven rejoicing, or do they laugh at our stupidity? A former Jesuit priest, Father Salvatore Freschetto, has deeply researched this aspect of the phenomenon in several books like Defendi Monos de los Diosis, in defense against the gods, that are not yet aviable in English, unfortunately. He argues convincingly that the spiritual control system of which UFOs are a part may have resulted in the religious myths that keep mankind in a state of abject submission to obsolete myths. In our private conversations, he implied that the phenomenon originates with entities that manipulate our reality and our destiny for their own purposes. Using our naivete and our lack of critical judgment in the presence of miracles, these entities, in his view, play with our emotions in order to be worshipped as gods. The Mormon Story I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. He called me by name, and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, and that his name was Moroni, that God had a work for me to do, and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds and tongues. Thus begins the account of the revelation of the Book of Mormon with the story of what transpired on the night of September 21, 1823, between Joseph Smith and an angel. The book itself, the angel stated, was in the form of gold plates that lay buried at a certain spot and could be translated with the help of two stones in silver containers that were buried with the plates. After this communication, I saw the light in the room begin to gather immediately around the person of him who had been speaking to me, and it continued to do so, until the room was again left dark, except just around him, when instantly I saw, as it were, a conduit open right up into heaven, and he ascended until he entirely disappeared. In 1842, at the request of Colonel Wentworth of the Chicago Democrat, Joseph Smith wrote a sketch of the history of the Mormon Church that contained additional details on the apparition, on a sudden a light like that of day, only of a far purer and more glorious appearance and brightness, burst into the room, indeed the first sight was as though the house was filled with consuming fire. The appearance produced a shock that affected the whole body. In a moment a personage stood before me surrounded with a glory yet greater than that by which I was already surrounded. I was told where there were deposited some plates, on which was engraved an abridgment of the records of the ancient peoples that had existed on this continent. The angel appeared to me three times the same night and unfolded the same things. It is important to note that this apparition was not Joseph's first vision. Indeed, he had been forbidden to join any of the religious sects of the day because he had claimed to have been favored by a mystical revelation while he was alone in the wilderness at the age of fourteen. When Angel Moroni appeared to him Joseph Smith had been praying for a vision, for, he says, I had full confidence in obtaining a divine manifestation, as I had previously had one. The angel appeared three times during the night of September 21, 1823, which happens to be the autumnal equinox, repeating exactly the same words. After the third time Joseph was surprised to hear the cock crow and to find that daylight was approaching so that our interviews must have occupied the whole of that night. Joseph Smith got up and began his normal chores, but he found himself so exhausted, like the children at Fatima, that he couldn't work in any useful way. His father thought he was sick and told him to go home. On the way he fell when trying to climb a fence and remained unconscious. The angel then appeared to him once more and told him to repeat his words to his father and to reveal his instructions. 
the father told Joseph to go and do as he had been commanded and said that these things were of God. Thus, the young man was allowed to go to the place where the plates were buried. He found them inside a stone box, which he had no difficulty opening, but he was unable to take the plates out of the box. Again the angel appeared, and it told him to come back precisely in one year and every year after that, four years later he would be permitted to take the plates. The remainder of the story is well known. Thanks to the help of a wealthy farmer named Martin Harris, Smith was able to work on the translation of the golden plates, which he read with the help of special stones he had found in the box. When Harris took the plates and the beginning of the translation to Professor Charles Anthony of New York, this learned gentleman stated that the translation was correct, more so than any he had before seen translated from the Egyptian. Looking at the plates that had not yet been translated, he said that they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyrian, and Arabic, and the professor signed a statement to that effect, which he later tore to pieces, however, when he learned that the young man had found the plates upon the instruction of an angel. Eleven persons have stated that they saw the plates unearthed by Joseph Smith. In June 1829, in response to a communication obtained by Smith, the Mormon prophet retired to the woods accompanied by Martin Harris, David Whitmer, and Oliver Cowdery, and knelt in fervent prayer, hoping to receive a vision of the plates. As nothing happened, Martin Harris withdrew from the group, believing that it was his presence that prevented the miracle from taking place. The others resumed their prayers and, after a few minutes, an angel stood before them, holding the plates, he turned over the leaves one by one, so that we could see them and discern the engravings thereon distinctly. The Book of Mormon was first published in 1830. It is a strange document, similar in many ways to the Oas Bible or the Book of Urantia, to accounts of early history similarly inspired by divine intelligence. The Oas Bible is an account of the origins and antiquity of mankind and contains many references to the Red Men. It was received psychically by John Ballou Newbrow about 1881, and it originated with shining beings whom he called angels. It is futile to engage in a debate concerning the truth or falsity of the statements made by Joseph Smith. We are looking here for indications of a higher order, and we can define as a miracle any event, real or imagined or even faked, which creates certain paranormal but verifiable effects. The transformation of an ordinary farm boy from rural New York State into an unchallenged leader of multitudes is an unusual fact that deserves attention even if we doubt the story. When we trace the turning point of this man's life to the sighting of a strange light and to contact with an entity inside the light, I believe the account needs to be preserved along with those we have already found in other faiths and other lands. Evans Wentz was intrigued by Joseph Smith's very first vision, which was not an apparition of Angel Moroni but of two entities whose names he was not privileged to learn. This took place as the 14-year-old Smith was praying in a wood, as related in the book The Pearl of Great Price. I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested on me I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all descriptions, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me. As the translator of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Evans once recognized that the role played by Smith in bringing out the Book of Mormon was similar to that of the Turtons, the takers out of secreted scriptures in Tibet. However, the Book of Mormon claims to be the sacred history of ancient America. It states that the Indians are the remnant of an Israelite tribe that settled in America 600 years before Christ. This is a difficult statement to take seriously in the light of modern anthropology. Thus we are again confronted with a mixture of certainty and absurdity, of fact and fantasy. Were such messages deliberately given to isolate the believers from the society around them? In an article published in the April 1974 issue of Occult Magazine, Jerome Clark and Loren Coleman point out that the history of Mormonism also contains many references to three mysterious beings said to be three of Christ's American Apostles, who asked to be allowed to remain on earth until his second coming. The three Nephites have been seen several times since the days of Joseph Smith and form an interesting and colorful counterpart to the three men in black of modern UFO lore. These Nephites are sometimes seen singly, and they perform miracles and healings. In one of the stories quoted by Clark and Coleman, a Utah woman named Squires, 
who was expecting the return of her husband and had seen no one around her house while drawing water from the well a minute before, suddenly found herself confronted with a gray-haired man wearing a long white beard, who requested something to eat and soon remarked that she was not well. When she acknowledged that indeed she was suffering from a pain under her shoulder, the unknown man replied, God bless you, sister. You will never want for anything again. You will always be blessed with plenty. He walked out the door, but when Mrs. Squires followed him outside he had vanished, and she could not see where he had gone. The date of the incident is given as the summer of 1874. Her health and money problems disappeared soon after, and she lived to the age of 89. A Unified Theory of Apparitions In many UFO stories of the olden days, the witnesses thought they had seen angels from God and for this reason never bothered to report their experiences. Others thought they had seen devils. The difference may be small. Commenting on the childhood experiences of Edgar Casey and Uri Geller, a British researcher named Peter Rogerson has reminded me that similar stories were common in accounts of mediums of various kinds. He wrote to me that, Andrew Jackson Davis, the Poughkeepsie seer, claimed to have met a mystical personage who gave him a staff in which there were little boxes which gave cures to various diseases. The account follows the classical pattern of the evolution of the shaman. Mercia Eliade in his book Shamanism records the words of various shamans and how they became aware of the shamanistic powers. Accounts are often of the nature I was washing by the river when a great ball of fire came down from the sky, it entered me, then I knew I was to become a shaman. Since the publication of my earlier books, I have received many interesting letters along similar lines. Until now I thought I had seen a messenger from heaven, writes one witness. I understand, having read your book, that I had witnessed a UFO. Some of the stories are strange yet consistent enough to become the nucleus of a new religious movement if the witness were of the proper psychological inclination. Perhaps only one close encounter in 10,000 starts a new faith, a new sect, or a new belief. When the right combination of social and psychological conditions is met, when the phenomenon finds in a witness a ready believer, then revelation takes place. Everything works as if the revelation were designed to isolate the witness, prophet, or believer from his social environment. He often becomes an outcast and has to flee. This has been the fate of numerous UFO witnesses. In France, several farmers saw their fields nearly ruined by curious or antagonistic crowds. The man in Michigan who reported the swamp gas case was jeered at in the streets, and people came in cars to throw bottles at his house. The believers, if they seek a climate in which to pursue their new life in accordance with the implications of their vision, have to create their own sect and move away. Moses did this. So did Joseph Smith. Often one sees the leader deserted by his wife and family. The spouse is especially likely to feel rejected and to betray him at the time when he or she most needs comfort. The wife of Martin Harris burned 116 newly translated pages of the Book of Mormon. The wives of several American policemen involved in modern UFO incidents divorce them. Sometimes the specific instructions given to the believers are such that their group continues to be persecuted for centuries, Jews, and have to endure great hardships before finding a place where they can settle down, Israel, Utah. The leaders are harassed by crowds, in one town the police chief's own trailer was destroyed by fire, blamed on arson, and occasionally put to death. Jesus was crucified, Joseph Smith was lynched by a crowd in Illinois. I think the stage is set for the appearance of new faiths, centered on the UFO belief. To a greater degree than all the phenomena modern science is confronting, the UFO can inspire awe, the sense of the smallness of man, and an idea of the possibility of contact with the cosmic. The religions we have briefly surveyed began with the miraculous experience of one person, but today there are thousands for whom the belief in otherworldly contact is based on intimate conviction, drawn from what they regard as personal contact with UFOs and their occupants. The phenomenon and its effects are working here as they have worked at Fatima and Lourdes and in other places, as a spiritual control system. The table below should make this clear. The first column summarizes the physical effects described by witnesses of the miracles we have reviewed, in the actual words of the persons who reported them. The second column contains descriptions of the state of the persons contacted by UFOs, 
both during and after the experience, the citing references are to the catalog published in my earlier book, Passport to Magonia. I think the reader can draw his or her own conclusions. I have barely scratched the surface. Indeed, I invite you to seek other documents in any library to complete this morphology or miracles with fresh material. This is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of Alien Contact Part 9. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please proceed to Part 10, before YouTube deletes it. Thank you for listening.